there's a place for you to take notes if you'd like to. Um, it's on the, just on the next page over from your um, Grace Group discussion time. Who's that? Who likes to take notes? Old school, like write down notes. Okay. All right. One of the things that we'll do in Grace Groups is we'll share each time a point that you learned either from the message or maybe from even from each other during Grace Group time. So uh, I encourage you to think through those and and uh, enjoy sharing that time together. Uh, thank you all of you who are joining us online. I'm glad the technology is cooperating so far. <laughs> and uh, we will, we, are, we always record these, so if you ever miss a session, you can either join us online like the gals are tonight, or you can go back later and watch it on, on YouTube as well. So thank you all for joining us, especially it's late. We have Iowa and um, Indiana joining us tonight. So they're, it's, past, it's past my bedtime. I know, probably past their bedtime as well. Um, so I have a question for you tonight. It might be a little bit off topic for the Bible study, um, but did you know that the day before yesterday was National Cheeseburger Day? Yeah. All right, okay. Well, you guys are all well informed. On the day before that was Monte Cristo Sandwich Day. Right? Who, who's had a Monte Cristo sandwich? Right? It's all like an old school sandwich. The 16th was Cinnamon Raisin Bread Day. I like it. I know some people don't really like that. I like Cinnamon Raisin Bread as well. But if you don't like that, it was also Guacamole Day. Uh, we can all, right? So many days for celebrating food. So many days. And you know what? We're hungry. There's no wonder why there's so many days to celebrate food. And not just for guacamole. We are hungry to be fed truth. Rich truth. It makes a difference in all of our lives right now and gives us hope and wisdom for the future. Because we need it, don't we? Right? And here's what is so amazing. When God called his people, when he called them, when he saved them and set them apart... Do you know what the first thing that he did was? Can we lose our screen already? Okay. Every little chit chat I hear out there, I'm like, is there something going on behind? No. <laughs> Hopefully we won't lose it tonight. But when he saved his people, when he set his people apart, the very first thing, almost the very first thing that he did, people who had been slaves for 400 years, he gave them a new calendar of all the things that he could give his people. What would a slave's calendar have been filled with? Work. More work. Work some more and keep working. Monday work, Tuesday work, Wednesday work, no hump day because it's all just work days. All work days, right? No weekends. Every day was get back to work day. But God did something different. He gave his people a calendar and it was filled with reminders, not of guacamole day, but reminders of what he had done for them and reminders of what he would be doing for them, things that they didn't even know were happening yet. In fact, just this past weekend was one of those calendar days. Uh, observant Jews to this day celebrate, they pause for Yom Teruah, or maybe you've heard it called Rosh Hashanah. How many of you are familiar, you've heard of that. Maybe you saw posts on Facebook even of that. All right? This is one of the many, many, many days on the calendar that Jews and even Christians to this day have been celebrating for over 3,000 years. Isn't that incredible? It's incredible. I mean, God saved his people. He set his people apart. And then he also set apart days. And he set apart weeks and even certain years. And these set apart days are called Moedim. Can you say that? Moedim. I told you last time we were going to learn some Hebrew, so we might as well begin, right? Moedim. Moedim, that means appointed times. Appointed times. That's just one of the many things that we're going to learn about in this study. What should we hope for in this study? Why are you here? There's probably as many answers as there are people, and probably even more, because you're probably here for more than just one reason, or two, or three right? But I'd like to suggest that the most important thing, the most important reason is the answer that God gave his people 3,500 years ago. Know me. Know me. Who is this God who saves and sets apart his people for himself? And the answer is all wrapped up in the verse that you see up here on the screen. It's actually on the front cover of your um, 
If your whole notebook, if you've got a notebook, it's right there on the front cover. It's up here behind me on the screen. Who is this God? Well, it's there in the very first verse that we memorized in this past study as well. Hear, O Israel. Let's go ahead and say it together. Ready? Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. From Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 5. So, of course, we're memorizing that. And we did it for the last two weeks. We're going to memorize it all year long. And I talked to you about how um, it's very important of Jews to this day say it twice a day, morning and evening. It's very central, of course, to our faith as well. And as we move through it, we're going to learn to say it together in in Hebrew. And we talked about that last time as well. So we're going to practice that tonight. All right. So remember, English is read from right to um, from left to right and Hebrew is from right to left the opposite side so we begin with our verse like we would say it here O Israel um, the Lord our God the Lord is one you know that part right mm-hmm. all right let's can you say that part <laughs> so yes that is it's Shema Israel now when you take a look at those words up there you I want you to see a letter that looks like a W a little bit like a W okay. Right? So it's the very first sound of the first word, Shema, and it's the sh sound. Oh, okay. And then if you look at the word Israel, it's actually also the s sound. So it's sh, and then it's also s. If you look carefully, you'll see there's a dot that makes the difference that you'll start to recognize. Oh, it's a sh when the dot is there, and it's a s when the dot is over there. Do you see that? Oh, okay. The dot? All right, that'll help you to start recognizing it. So can you say that in Hebrew? Shema Israel. All right, now go ahead and say the rest. <laughs> so the rest of this is Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. Now what's interesting is this very first word, Adonai, is not at all what those letters say. Those letters say Yod, that's the first letter, He. Like, the, hey, is the letter that was added to make Abram's name into Abraham. It was a he, he that was added there. So that's Yod, He, Bab, He. It has nothing to do with Adonai. So why we say Adonai? We say it because in Scripture there's a verse that says to not pronounce the name unless you oh. pronounce it incorrectly. So Jews started a tradition of not pronouncing it. And so they just say Adonai whenever they see that. We don't, you can say that, it's perfectly fine, um, but actually it's Yahweh, Yahweh. Um, we, don't, we don't know exactly how to pronounce it, but we know pretty sure it's, it's, it's Yahweh or something along those lines. Anyway, you'll start to learn and recognize that as well. So let's try to say it together now, all in Hebrew, just one fell soup. You ready? Shema Israel Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad. Now I'm going to teach you a little melody to help you to remember that. You know, songs, if you learn them in a song, it'll help you a little bit better. It goes like this. And this is a common melody uh, sung by cantors in synagogues to this day. Uh, there's a lot of ways to sing the Shema. This is one of the most common melody lines for this, and it goes like this. Shema Israel Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad. You try that with me? Here we go. Shema Israel Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad. Beautiful. All right. You, that wasn't bad at all. Very good. So we'll get used to that, and we'll sing it, and we'll say it, and you'll start to recognize the letters, because in the lesson coming up, there's a lot of Hebrew for you. And uh, so hopefully you'll start to kind of learn it and uh, enjoy that part of the study as well. So one of the things that's distinct about our Bible study is we like to say that we don't do Bible study, we dwell. We dwell. And we went into that a lot in the last uh, lesson. So let's go ahead and remind ourselves what that looks like. This is based on Colossians 3, 16, and this defines who we are as women together. So let's go ahead and say this. Together we are women who enthusiastically and intentionally dwell in the word and let the word of Christ dwell in us 
richly. That's who we are. And then w with a bit of review, I want to walk through again how we're going to get there, how we're going to accomplish doing that together. Um, it all comes from reading in context. We make sure we're understanding we're reading an ancient document that it's set in a, a specific time frame, very different than ours, uh, written by people who wrote literally another language, but also had a different mindset and a worldview than we do. Um, and we can understand it and be blessed by it, but we're going to ask good questions to think it through. When exactly is this happening? Where? Because the geography will help you to understand. That's going to come into play in this coming lesson. If you know the geography of the area, you'll say, oh, then this must have been happening if it was kind of in this area. You ask who, you ask why, and things like that. We begin with a big flyover of our lessons, like you did this last time. So you got this big scoping arc overview of uh, the material that we're covering from this point forward all the way through until November. And then we do a drive through. We get down on the ground and we move through the lesson. Each lesson is an invitation to pray, to memorize the word and meditate. You'll have a focus scripture to memorize and meditate as you go through, to read, just simply read, to study the word, to write. We're going to begin to write the word. Some of you already know what that means. I'll talk about that more in a minute. And of course, create and share, which you just had a chance to share your create and share um, last time. But I want to encourage you to trust the process and to trust the Holy Spirit as you do your Bible study. Offering a Bible study like this, and I said this last time, is a chance to get like a, an all-you-can-eat buffet. <laughs> uh, maybe you've had a, a yummy buffet before and you, you've enjoyed it, maybe even on a cruise or something like that. But we're going to walk through the Dwelling Richly Buffet um, with the way that this Bible study is offered. And so over the course of the next 10 days or 14 days, two weeks, um, we're going to do again a, a rhythm the same flow will happen each time. Day one is today, and that's where you come together. And here we are. Hello, everyone. And you connect with each other, and you grow as you hear each other's story. On day two, uh, that's tonight if you're super excited and eager and still awake, uh, or, or it's tomorrow morning, <laughs> maybe. Uh, but that's your flyover day. And you can see that I've outlined it for you. If you look on page 44 in lesson two, you will see that. Go ahead and turn to that page in your lesson handout right now. And this is always how it starts, the lesson flyover day. It's time to think through your plans and make a plan because maybe you already know uh, that you are going to be out of town or got a busy week, whatever. You can write in dates so that you can have a good rhythm to your study. Um, and then you'll see everything outlined here for you. All the reading passages are there for you and then also the write the word passage. Below that on the same page, you'll see the memorize and meditate portion and that's our Bible verse that we're memorizing this week. This time around, our memory verse is actually coming from the write the word portion. Uh, write the word is going to be all of Psalm 105. So. Uh, if you've been with our Bible study before, we've done Hebrews and we've done Romans, we've done Ruth and Esther, we've done Luke, lots of them. And when it's uh, kind of smaller books of the Bible, we do write the entire thing. We're doing four books of the Bible this time. We are not going to write Exodus through Deuteronomy, but we are going to write large passages of scripture. Uh, when we did Hebrews, we wrote all of Hebrews. When we did Romans, we wrote all of of Romans. And so you'll see that. And um, there's some good benefits of learning to, to get out that pen or pencil and hand write. And I've given you some science-based research about how it stimulates your brain to actually get a pen out or a pencil and write. A fascinating research. So much so that public schools are actually bringing back cursive handwriting. They, they, they ditched it for a while. And now they're seeing that the benefits and kids have better fine motor skills and better, better cognitive left brain right brain hemisphere conversations with itself and so they're bringing it back in many of the schools uh, the write the word pages are at the back of your packet i'm including four of those for you in this lesson in future lessons because not everybody does the write the word they'll just be on the back table to replenish or you can download them on the website or you can just use a journal if you want to do your write the word um, in the in a journal um, and then um, at the bottom of that same page that you were on, on page 44, you'll see two newish things. Uh -huh. So um, if you're trying to do your lesson, you realize you're short on time, look for the little hearts in the red and yellow circle there. Focus on those questions. Those are really going to be key questions for you. And then if you want more, and uh, this is what it, the, the dwelling deeper part came out for me, because I'll go through and I'll write up all the questions and move through the whole passage and then realize I need to not have all those questions, but I edit a lot out. And then they just end up on the floor of my 
you know, in my house. And so instead of doing that, I'm putting them at the end of the lesson for you. So anything that I, I edited out, I'm going to just stick at the end. And if you want to embrace that and have fun with it, dwell deeper, look for the little blue Bible to do that. So here's the big overview. Two weeks, you have 10 days, right? So starting today, come connect and grow. Day two, tomorrow or tonight, whenever, is your flyover day. And days three through nine is your drive through where you're going to like have that buffet out before you from picking shoes or do it all. And just like going to a buffet, you know, <laughs> you can go to a buffet as many times as you want and pick as much as you want out, or you could just get one little plate and come back with a little snacky, uh, whatever you need. The buffet is there and I'm, um, well, I'm, I'm the guy serving the buffet to you. And uh, uh, create and share is one of those special days where, <laughs> Well, special for some. It's a little bit horrifying for others who don't like to draw. <laughs> Julie. Anyway. Um, <laughs> I know, I know, I know. But it's not always drawing either. I, sometimes you do. This happened to be drawing, this one. Anyway, so create and share is the opportunity to bring that together. Here's some samples of, of people who've shared those. And where am I getting these? Well, they're putting them in our group. We have an app. As they're taking a quick picture and they're dropping them in the app. I love it because we get inspired by each other. We laugh and giggle at ourselves and we say, hey, that's a good job. And aren't we all just like a bunch of fifth graders who want a gold star on our chart? Okay, so there's that. Uh, this was sweet because Rachel's is here is the one with the little stick figure and the words around it. And then she went ahead and posted what the kids said. My kids helped me think of the different attributes and they both quizzed me on my memory verse. Haha. <laughs> they thought that was super cool since it's normally me quizzing them on their memory verses for school. <laughs> so she put that in our group on the app. So I encourage you to engage. We have a wonderful community in there. We're talking, we're sharing. So please get on the app and, and be a part of that. And remember that dwelling richly isn't just doing Bible study. It's an invitation and it's a buffet. And so, yeah, I'm this guy, right? Put my face on his, right? I'm just offering it all there for you to, to enjoy. It's an invitation. It's an invitation for you to grow as deep and to get as wide as you possibly can imagine, to have fun, to learn a ton in God's word and to be part of the community. The Bible study is personal. It's one-on-one. -on -one. It's time with you and Jesus through the Holy Spirit. You're gonna read the passages and they're gonna inspire you and they're gonna transport you. And then you're gonna see yourself in the people. You're gonna see yourself in the good and the hopeful moments and the qualities. And you're gonna see yourself in the disappointing and discouraging and why am I still struggling with this and identify with those knucklehead people so much <laughs> as you go through it. There's gonna be some passages that you're gonna go through that are simple to grasp and you're like, I totally get that. And then there's others, honestly, that are gonna leave you maybe frustrated confused and I always like to say if you are reading through the Bible and you don't find yourself at one point saying what I don't understand that at all or they did that or oh, that's too much it should be rated you know those types of things you're not paying attention if you're not noticing those things and so embrace that and don't be afraid to admit that out loud because it, it is a very different culture and we're going to learn to understand it and appreciate it for what it was. And so it's okay if you feel frustrated. It's okay if you get to a passage and, you're have, and you have questions. It's okay. Just pause. When you get to those types of prompts in the study day, a uh, question maybe that I've asked, please know that the goal from my heart isn't that you come up with the right answer. Please don't start any weird cult based on some weird answer you might have come up with. We always like to say we don't start a church on those types of things, but we dialogue. But this is you engaging and learning and dwelling in the word. Um, some answers you're going to get later. You might have to pause on one and then move down and then go, uh, I get it now, and then go back and fill it in. Others you're just going to leave big and blank and come and ask your discussion group and, and get some ideas from them. And others you're gonna say for me after we do the end of this talk and we have Q&R time. And then you can play stump the teacher like we like to do, right? So what I want you to do is just lay it all before God, right? And I invite you just to dwell in the word, all right? So remember, God is with you, but he's a gentleman. So invite him. Invite him into that time. Through the Holy Spirit, you can have him right 
with you as you study. Pray as you begin. Be intentional. That's what we say we are. We intentionally dwell. Be intentional about inviting him in. Resist the temptation to just jump in and start doing Bible study. Pause and pray as you move into it. Our goal is to love God, heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the books that we're going to be reading, the rest of the Torah, Exodus through Deuteronomy, we're not just reading about Moses, about what he did, about these people and that land. This isn't just a bunch of laws that are kind of weird to us and hard to follow. We're reading what it means to be saved and set apart for us today, right? Our goal then is to love God with heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to understand what Jesus himself said about this. If you believe Moses, you would believe me, right? Why? Because he, Moses, wrote about me, Jesus said. In the lesson that you just did, you met Moses and you read about Jesus, even though you didn't see the word Jesus in there. But you got the big flyover as you were doing your reading and you're engaging in Exodus and the selections that I had for you in Leviticus and in Numbers. And what you covered are all the passages that we're going to be covering deeper in now in lessons two through five, um, the first half of this study that'll take us now and through November. So welcome to session two. Where are we going? <laughs> This is the introduction to the rest of the Torah, Exodus through Deuteronomy, and how to read these books of the Bible. For starters, we are reading and studying the very books that Jesus said, again, if you believed Moses, you would believe me. And they would have been thinking, well, we do believe Moses. And what's the implied response then? Believe me, <laughs> Jesus is saying. For he wrote of me. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? So we are never going to unhitch, disentangle, forget about the Old Testament. In fact, we prefer not to even call it the Old Testament. Because what do people tend to do with old things? We throw them away. We, we stick them out on the sidewalk for some of the big <laughs> So this isn't the Old Testament. We call this the foundational testament or the first testament, the first covenant testament that God gave his people. You know, after his resurrection, Jesus appeared to a couple of really discouraged men who hadn't heard that Jesus had rose from the dead. That's pretty big news to miss out on. But Jesus just shows up and starts walking on this path with them. Do you remember the story in Luke 24? And they don't recognize him, not yet. And then they start telling this stranger, we had hoped, he, they say, we had hoped that Jesus would be the one to do what? Redeem Israel, right? Listen to what Jesus did. And beginning with what? Moses and the prophets. That's what we're reading. Beginning with Moses and the prophets, he interpreted to them all the scriptures in the things concerning himself. So beginning with Moses, we are going to see Jesus as well. And we will cover point by point to learn to see Jesus and to learn to recognize him. Seeing Jesus is, of course, easier for us today because we're on this side of the cross, right? Mm -hmm. We're literally in a time defined by Jesus, Anno Domini. A.D., years or year of our Lord. And every year before Christ is B.C., before Christ. And of course, we're now at A.D. in that period, so it's easier for us, right? We can still get a little lost if we don't know who we're looking for or if we treat it like the Old Testament, right? We are going to learn to see Jesus. How many of you remember this guy? Remember him? I actually have like the first book. We got this years and years and years ago up in a neat bookstore up in Santa Barbara when these books first started coming out. I've had this book forever and ever. Waldo, right? You'd look for him. He would be hidden in the scenes. Uh, this, the guy with the striped shirt on. And you found him. You would know exactly where to look next time for him, right? And then it's, it's hard to not see him 
from that point forward. You always know on that page is going to be right there. And maybe you'll help other people see them if you turn that page and you're trying to help other people do that as well. That's what we're going to find in this study. We're learning to look, not for Waldo, of course, <laughs> but for Jesus. We're learning to look for Jesus. And more than that, we're going to look for God's bigger plan, right? Listen, the world is looking for this hope. The world needs this. You have someone in your life right now who needs this hope that you love so much. So not only are you going to learn to look and find, you are going to learn how to better share it with somebody else to help them find, not Waldo, but to help them find Jesus, right? So that when you hear them say, oh, you know, the Bible, it's just the dismissive or what, you're going to be like, oh, you don't understand. <laughs> Let me help you understand. You're going to be able to say that by the end of this study. I promise you, you will. You know, we have the advantage of already knowing the end of the story, of knowing exactly what Jesus looks like in a sense, that he is there. And we are working our way backward, beginning with Moses. So Exodus is a part of that bigger picture of the Torah. The first five books of the Bible for Jews and for Christians as well. The other name for these five books is Pentateuch. Maybe you've heard that word, Penta, five. And Tukos is scroll, five scrolls. In fact, all the books of the Bible and the Hebrew are actually referred to as scrolls. A, a little extra tidbit there. Esther, the book of Esther, is like the scroll. So they, they will refer to Esther as a very special elevated one. But in general, they refer to the books of the Bible as the scroll. So Genesis is the beginning, of course. Literally, the Hebrew word for this book is breshit. There's another Hebrew word for you. Uh, so Genesis, what do we find? If you were in their study with us two years ago, you get the beginning of creation, you get the fall of man, you get the promise of redemption eventually coming, the beginning of human civilization, literally the first cities, the first art, the first music, the first war, the first murder, all the first. We had a lot of fun finding all the first as we went through that uh, Genesis study. And the beginning then of also God's covenant relationship with his chosen people. So Genesis starts off really big, literally huge with the universe being created and then it narrows down, narrows down, narrows down, boom, to one guy. You remember who he was? Abraham. Abraham. And so from there, God just starts bringing it together to bring his seed forward to accomplish, to accomplish his plan. So the beginning of Genesis, we have these three words. And now open up your Bibles, and maybe you can find them as well. To the very first page of Genesis. I, it's, it's off. It's probably the internet crash, so I already clicked it off. Okay. Um, hopefully the rest of it's going as well on YouTube, but we'll see. Whatever. Internet. Um, go to the beginning of your Bible. Find the first three words of Genesis. And you'll see it says, you probably knew this without even looking it up. In the beginning. The, that word three in English is actually one word in Hebrew, and it's breshit, breshit, all right? Now, I want you to skip forward a few thousand years, and uh, a thousand or so. I want you to go all the way to the end of Genesis now, the end of Genesis. I want you to find the final words at the end of Genesis. You're going to have to go 15, and then 16, and then 28, and then 48, and 50, all the way to the end. You got that? What are the final words in Genesis? You see them there? In Egypt. In Egypt. In Egypt. So take a look at the Hebrew here. In the beginning, Breshit, and now we're in Egypt. What do you see similar there? The B. That first letter is the same, right? So we have Breshit in beginning, in the beginning, and we have now in Egypt, Be. Misraim. So how do you say Egypt in Hebrew? Misraim. There you go. All right. So in the beginning, Beshit, and then in Egypt, Misraim. Genesis ends with God's people in Egypt. Brought there on purpose under his protection, his plan, his provision, because God worked through Joseph to save his people from a famine right? And if you've been at church with us on Sundays, isn't that exciting that that's literally what we're going through right now on Sundays at church? And that this Bible study for you all here was planned two years ago 
No conversation with Joe about the timing. It's just God's amazing timing. So God had promised to Abraham 200 years prior to this event, before this, he had made Abraham an incredible promise. So go ahead and move now to Genesis 15 in your Bible. And you're thinking at this point, I thought we were sitting Exodus Richmond. We got to get there. We're setting this up. He says in Genesis 15, beginning in verse 13, a covenant to Abraham. Know for certain, this is God talking to Abraham. Know for certain that your offspring will be sojourners in a land that is not theirs and will be servants there. And they will be afflicted for 400 years. But I will bring judgment on the nation that they serve. And afterward, they shall come out with great possessions. Do you see any mention of Misraim in this passage? No, Egypt is mentioned. Abraham just gets the promise. He doesn't know what's going to happen. Of course, he's going to be long gone by this point. So Genesis closes with God's people right where he said they'd be. Be Misraim in Egypt. Only they're not afflicted at all. Not at the end of Genesis, right? Not yet. They're enjoying life at this point. But now, are you ready? Go back to Genesis, the very end of Genesis, Beiris Raim. Genesis at the end, the last two words. You ready? Now turn the page, and with that, 400 years. 400 years in one turn of the page. All right? Exodus opens, and it's been 400 years. The people have multiplied. And they're strong, and there's a new kid on the block. (laughs) Only he's not a kid. He's a mean, evil dictator pharaoh. (laughs) There arose a new king over Egypt who did not know Joseph or care about him. And he set taskmasters over them to afflict them with heavy burdens. They ruthlessly made the people of Israel work as slaves and made their lives bitter with hard service. You see God fulfilling Because he told Abraham, this is what's going to happen. And now we know the where. Oh, Misraim, it's in Egypt that this is going to happen. So Exodus, Shemot, which records God's delivery of his covenant people from the bondage of slavery, preparation for them to possess the promised land that he had set aside for them, a promise that he had made already to Abraham throughout Genesis over and over and over again. You hear him repeating that. We find that covenant that God makes with Israel at Mount Sinai. And we're going to move in on that during this week. Leviticus follows, and you can say the Hebrew word for Leviticus, Vayikra, can you say that? Vayikra. Numbers is Bamidbar, Bamidbar. And Deuteronomy is Devarim. Now, just so you know, all these slides are available on my website. You can go print them all off. You can get the little, you can save those and maybe use them as little study cards if you want to as well and uh, have that as you move through this study. So this study is going to bring us through the rest of the Torah, the Torah that we started in Genesis two years ago to see how God saved and set apart his people. And here's what's exciting. How many of you were with us in the first and second Corinthians study last year? We did Genesis, and then we did 1st, 2nd Corinthians. Get ready. There are so many connections to 1st and 2nd Corinthians. You are going to be blown away by it. You know how Paul got over the case of the, of the Corinthians? They're so much like Israel. You'll see it. As you read, you're like, oh, my goodness, Paul could have been there with his finger <laughs> out there, okay? So... This is going to help us to see how God saved and set apart his people, how he made good on his promises. And that's great. That's history. Literally his story. But what about about us? What about me today, right now, right? In this study, we're going to see how God is the same yesterday, of course, today and forever. He is, as he introduced himself to Moses, truly the I am. He is the Eye, Asher, Eye, that's what this says up here. Eye, the first word, I am. Asher, there's the sh sound. Do you see it in there? The sh with the dot. And then eye, eye, asher, eye. Moses saw the glory of God in the bush that day, and from that day forward, he was unique in all of history to see God face to face, which is a figure of speech, um, because it says in Exodus 33. 
face to face he saw God as a man speaks to his friend, unique in all of history. Moses was led then by God's instructions to give the people a way to build a place for God to dwell among them. So at every page of the study, we're going to look for and see the I am, the one who was with Moses and the people and the one who's with us here today. He's not in a tabernacle. He's not in a temple. Where is he? Here, in us. We're the temple now. That's where God dwells. That's why as you read through this study, you're going to go, ha, ha, I get it now. You're going to go back to Corinthians and go, oh my goodness, I totally get this, I understand. Jesus in Exodus is our deliverer. He's the Passover lamb. He's the manna from heaven, the bread from heaven. He's the rock. He's the tabernacle. In Leviticus, he's the feasts and the festivals that we will learn and move through right now as we're going through God's calendar. He's the scapegoat. He's the high priest. In Numbers, he's the king. He's a serpent that was lifted up. Maybe you remember that verse from John where he says, just so as the serpent was raised, uh, raised up in the wilderness, so must the son of man be lifted up, right? We're going to see that as we move through. He's the water from the rock. In Deuteronomy, he's the prophet that was foretold. He's the Messiah that's to be worshipped. He's the cities of refuge. And as we move through this study together, we're going to do exactly what this psalm saying in Psalm 105. We're going to have our memory verse from this psalm. And then this is also part of the write the word. That I really encourage you to try to do this, this first lesson especially, because together we're going to do this. Glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Seek the Lord and his strength. That's what we're going to be doing together. Seek his presence continually. We're going to change our mindset from I'm going to do my Bible study to this. I'm going to seek the Lord in his face. I'm going to seek his strength. I'm going to seek him continually. Remember the wondrous works that he has done, his miracles and his judgments. <laughs> the judgments he uttered, O offspring of Abraham, his servant, children of Jacob, his chosen ones. Who are we? We're the chosen ones. We are those people now by extension. And again, as you move through the study, you'll recall from our Roman study even, oh yeah, that's us. We were the wild and then the redeemed. We were the ones that were grafted in, right? We are those chosen ones. So I invite you in this study to dwell, to live like this, to let this be your mindset and to enjoy being in God's word together and be fascinated by it and be okay to be frustrated and stumped and just say, all right, Lord, what do you got? <laughs> this is good, but this is hard because God's got something big for all of us together. Let's pray.